Welcome back. So far we've discussed the formation of sales contracts. This is the first element of a contracting system to give us the requirements of a valid contract. Now we take up performance of a sales contract. Performance and breach, which is a failure to perform. So in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at are the issues related to performance. How do we know when a party has performed, when a buyer or a seller has performed under the agreement? Now, when we talk about performance, we're talking about the duties and obligations that each party has under a contract. And if the contract doesn't specify performance terms, meaning doesn't outline the duties and obligations of each party, then the UCC provides those duties and obligations. The basic obligation of the seller in any sales contract is to transfer and deliver conforming goods. And we'll talk about delivery and conforming goods uh, later, but this is the basic obligation of the seller. And the basic obligation of the buyer is to accept and pay for the conforming goods. So the seller has an obligation to deliver the goods, the buyer has an obligation to pay for the goods. So today we're going to look at what it means to perform and breach a sales agreement. And after this lecture, you should be able to answer the following questions. What's the difference between conforming and non-conforming goods? What is the perfect tender rule? What is the right to cure? What is a revocation of the contract as compared to rejection of non-conforming goods? And finally, what do we mean by the notion of commercial impracticability? Now, before we get started, remember obligations of good faith and commercial reasonableness underlie every sales and lease contract under the UCC. Therefore, even if the contract is silent as to questions of good faith, meaning honesty in fact, those obligations are there in the contract. So in every sales contract, there's an obligation on the part of both the buyer and the seller to act in good faith. And in fact, the parties cannot waive or disclaim the good faith requirement. The parties cannot agree that the good faith requirement doesn't apply. Now remember, for a non-merchant, good faith means honesty in fact, being honest. For a merchant, merchants have a higher standard of good faith. So for a merchant, good faith requires more than simple honesty. For a merchant, good faith requires two elements, honesty in fact, and the observance of reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing, meaning the merchant must act in the same manner as most other merchants act, what is reasonable under the circumstances. Now this question of good faith is going to be an uh, issue that a jury a finder of fact will ultimately decide. So in a lawsuit, the jury will decide whether the merchant acted in good faith or not, meaning the jury is going to decide whether the merchant was honest and whether the merchant met the standard of fair dealing. So let's start with this notion of obligation. So we know that uh, an obligation of good faith is in every contract. But the UCC also holds that sellers and buyers owe each other obligations. The seller is obligated to transfer and deliver conforming goods. That's the basic obligation of a seller. Now there's a concept called tender of delivery. And tender of delivery means that the seller will make the goods available to the buyer. The seller will do everything that is necessary in order to make the goods available to the buyer. And conforming goods are those items that conform to the contract in every possible way. Now, before making delivery, the seller must give the buyer reasonable notice of the uh, of the delivery. 
So the buyer has to be put on notice as to the delivery of the goods before the obligation to accept the goods apply. Now, tender must be at a reasonable time and in a reasonable manner, meaning the parties must, uh, the seller must make the delivery in a reasonable time and reasonable manner. Reasonableness means what is ordinary under the circumstances, what is usual for two entities in this particular type of transaction. And finally, goods have to be tendered in a single delivery unless the parties have made some other agreement. Remember, the parties always have the ability to create their own rules regarding obligation. But if the party does not, if the parties do not have a term in the contract, the goods must be tend tendered in a single delivery. Now, where should the goods be delivered? Well, the, con the UCC provides rules for the place of delivery for non-carrier contracts. If the contract doesn't specify a place of delivery, and we know the buyer is going to pick up the goods, then the place of delivery is the seller's business, where the seller does business. Where is the seller's location? If it does not specify a place of delivery. So if on your test there's a question about a place for delivery and the, um, and the contract is silent, we know that the buyer is going to pick up the goods at the seller's place of business. Now, if the parties both know that the goods are somewhere other than the seller's business, then their location is the place for delivery. This would come up in case of the goods are being stored in a warehouse. If the buyer and the seller both know that the goods are available at the warehouse, then that warehouse is the place for delivery. Now, there's two kinds of contracts delivery contracts delivery via carrier remember carrier is a is a third party not the buyer or the seller but an independent third party that's going to take the goods and transport them from the seller to the buyer now a shipment contract requires the seller to ship goods by a carrier and under a shipment contract, a seller must comply with the following. The seller must first of all put the goods into the hands of a carrier, must make arrangements, create an agreement for the transport of the goods, and to give to the buyer any documents necessary to get possession of the goods from the carrier. And finally, the seller must notify the buyer that shipment has been made. So in order to comply with its obligation to deliver the goods, if the goods are being um, sent via a shipment contract, a seller has to place the goods into the hands of a carrier, contract for their transport, give the buyer any documents necessary to get possession of the goods from the carrier, and tell the buyer that the shipment has been made. Now, the other type of delivery contract involving a carrier is known as a destination contract. And a destination contract is a contract in which the seller agrees to deliver conforming goods to the buyer at a specific destination, a particular destination. So, under a destination contract, in order to meet obligations of delivery as set forth in the UCC, the seller must tender the goods at a reasonable hour, keep the goods available for a reasonable period of time for the buyer to take possession, and obtain and promptly deliver any documents of title necessary for the buyer to take possession of goods from the carrier and finally promptly notify that the goods are available to take delivery. So a destination contract, remember a destination contract is any contract involving a carrier in which the goods are being sent to a specific destination.
The seller must tender the goods at a reasonable hour, say during business hours, and must make the goods available for a reasonable period of time, deliver any documents necessary to take possession of the goods from the carrier, and of course notify the buyer that the goods are available for her to take delivery. Now we've said that the seller's obligation is to tender to the buyer conforming goods. Let's talk a little bit more about tender and specifically the perfect tender rule. Now the perfect tender rule states that a seller has an obligation to deliver goods that conform with the contract in every tail, detail. If the goods delivered or tendered for delivery fail in any respect to conform to the terms of the contract, the buyer has options. The first of all, the buyer may accept the goods even if they fail to conform with the terms of the contract. The buyer has the right to accept the whole good delivery. The buyer also has a, a right to reject the whole delivery. If in fact the goods fail to conform to the terms of the contract, the buyer can reject delivery. Or the buyer may accept in part and reject the rest. So the buyer can accept any part of the delivery it wishes to accept and reject the rest of the non-conforming delivery. Now there are some exceptions to the perfect tender rule and these involve first of all agreement of the parties. And we've already talked about this multiple times that the parties have a right to control performance and therefore the parties can include exceptions to the perfect tender rule in their contract. This is something that you can disclaim in a contract or modify. There's another concept called a right to cure and the right to cure says that a seller that has delivered non-conforming goods may repair or adjust or replace those goods if the replacement occurs within the contract time for performance. If there is still time left to perform, if for instance the contract calls for delivery by October 31st, if the seller delivers on October 23rd and discovers that the goods are non-conforming, the seller retains a right for another week to repair or replace those non-conforming goods. Now, of course, this cure is going to be at the um, is on the expense of the um, of the seller. So, the contract the cure can be made within the time for performance. First of all, and also remember the right to cure is going to be limited by the buyer's obligation to inform the seller or lessor of the defect. If the defect is not disclosed, the buyer cannot later assert the defect as a defense if in fact the defect is the one that the seller could have cured. Finally, substitution of carriers. If an agreed manner of delivery becomes impracticable or unavailable, a substitute may be sufficient. If I arrange to ship the goods by FedEx and for some reason maybe FedEx drivers go on strike, even if I don't meet those terms, if I deliver it by UPS, if that is a reasonable substitute, I have a right to do so even if it does not conform with the carrier. Now this must be a commercially reasonable substitute and the seller is all is or, or normally responsible for any additional shipping cost again unless the contract states otherwise. Now an installment contract requires or authorizes delivery in two or more lots. Whenever we talk about an installment contract, we're talking about a contract that's going to be performed in part and then in part again. Two or more deliveries. 
Now, a buyer or lessee can reject an installment only if a non-conformity substantially impairs the value of the installment and cannot be cured. A buyer can reject the entire contract only when the non-conformity substantially impairs the value of the entire contract. Now, the perfect tender rule also does not apply when an unforeseen occurrence makes performance commercially impracticable. Occurrences that are unforeseen by either party, that were not contemplated by either party when a contract was made, may make performance commercially impracticable. Now, commercial impracticability only arises when the parties had no reason to anticipate that the event would occur at the time the contract was made. So there must be an element of non-foreseeability. And practicability is not impossibility. It simply an ex requires extreme difficulty in order to, um, to uh, obtain the uh, required benefit. Now these events, as I said, must have been unforeseen by either party at the time of contracting. In the cases of a commercial impracticability, delay in delivery or non-delivery in whole or in part may not be a breach of the contract. This is another exception to the perfect tender rule. Finally, destruction of the goods before the risk of loss has passed may excuse the parties from performance if the goods are destroyed prior to the passage of risk of loss the party may be excused from performance meaning the seller may be excused from selling the goods and the buyer excused from paying for the goods now in this case destruction of the goods must be an unexpected event that did not happen through the fault of either party say the warehouse in which they are goods are stored is uh, destroyed by a lightning strike causes a fire it must destroy identified goods those goods that are specifically set out in the contract and it must occur before the risk of loss pass to the buyer in those cases destruction of the goods may excuse the parties from performance under the contract if the goods are only partially destroyed, the buyer then has options. The buyer may accept in part or reject in part. The buyer may accept all the goods that are available. The buyer may choose to reject the whole. Now the UCC also governs concepts called assurance and cooperation. Now assurance means that if a party has reasonable grounds to believe that the other party will not perform, that party may demand what's called an assurance of performance. So if you are a seller and you discover that the buyer is insolvent and unlikely to be able to pay for the goods that you are selling, prior to delivering the goods you may demand what's called an assurance of performance, some guarantee that the party will perform. Similarly, if you're a buyer and you believe that the seller will not be able to deliver the goods, conforming goods, you may demand an assurance of performance. And if that assurance is not made, then in fact, you may be relieved of your obligation to perform under the contract, whether you are the seller or the buyer. If performance requires the co cooperation of the other party, a failure to cooperate relieves the obligation to perform. If in the sale cannot be completed without cooperation between the buyer and the seller, the party that fails to cooperate may uh, release the other party of its obligation to perform. So those are all the obligations of performance.
the seller that fall within its obligation of to deliver conforming goods. Now the basic obligation of the buyer is to accept and pay for those conforming goods. Now there are rules regarding acceptance or rejection of the goods. Before delivery or acceptance, the buyer has a right to inspect the goods in a reasonable manner. Back when we were talking about what are the expectations of the buyer and the seller, we know that the buyer wants to inspect the goods before paying for the goods. The buyer wants to confirm that the goods conform to the terms of the contract. And this right to inspect the goods is absolute, meaning a buyer is guaranteed to right to inspect the goods. Now, how long does the buyer have in order to um, inspect the goods? That's going to be based on the, the concept of reasonableness, what's reasonable under the circumstances. Nevertheless, the buyer has a right to inspect the goods before accepting them, before taking delivery. If the buyer accepts a part of the goods, that constitutes acceptance of the whole, meaning acceptance of any part of the goods. If you open one crate, you examine the goods within and, and decide to accept that crate, then it is the same as if you've accept, inspected every crate. Now, acceptance of the goods occurs when, first of all, the buyer agrees to do so, express acceptance, the buyer says, I accept the goods, or fails to make an effective rejection. That if in fact the uh, buyer fails to reject the goods as required by the terms of the contract or by the UCC, then in fact the buyer is deemed to have accepted the goods. Or if the buyer acts in a manner consistent with ownership then that too is evidence of acceptance of the goods, the buyer having accepted the goods. A buyer can accept only those goods that conform to the contract and reject the rest. Payment. So the buyer has an obligation to accept the goods and the buyer has an obligation to pay for the goods. The buyer can pay by any means specified by the parties or by any reasonable means if the method is not specified. Meaning, reasonable again, what is reasonable under the circumstances? What do others in the same or similar circumstance do? When a sale is on credit, a buyer must pay according to the terms of the credit agreement and not when the goods are received. The last thing we want to talk about is the notion of anticipatory repudiation. Now, anticipatory repudiation occurs when in fact it appears that the seller is not going to perform. And in cases of anticipatory repudiation, the buyer may treat the repudiation as a breach and cancel the contract, meaning walk away, be back in its pre-contract position. It may treat the repudiation as a breach and sue for damages or wait and see if the repudiating party retracts his repudiation and performs or seek adequate assurance of performance from the repudiating promisor. In any case, the non-repudiating promisee may suspend its performance. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? Obligations of good faith and commercial reasonableness underlie every sales and lease contract under the UCC. The basic obligation of the seller is to transfer and deliver conforming goods. The basic obligation of the buyer is to accept and pay for conforming goods. And that's all. Thanks for listening.